Terreno Adriatico Stage 4. It promised a little bit too. Uh, 201 Ks to Belante. They do a circuit, kind of like the end of the European Championships this stage. 4.2 Ks, 6%. The climb they do three times and they finish on it as well. A little bit harder than the Kios Dino style finish that Alaphilippe won on stage two last year. We have Ganner in the leader's jersey before this stage and Remco, Alaphilippe, Pagacha. And, yeah, Michael Matthews a little bit banged up. Ineos, Carapaz, Gagan Hart. But Quinn Simmons in the break, looking strong. I think he's MSR training, Benji. Yeah, I think so as well. I think he's training for the days to come. I'm also curious what he can do in the classics, by the way. We always know that he attacked early and then fell through when it actually mattered. Uh, but when it comes to today's stage, he was on the breakaway. I also don't know who was with him. I only saw him actually alone in the breakaway. I think he was solo from like the Fat Las Belante climb, which was that repetitive climb that you just spoke about. And that Belante climb was where we expected things to come. Before that climb, we knew that teams were already moving to the front on the left and right side of the road. We knew that Quickstep was already moving to the front. The way he was pacing or at least controlling it for the majority of this stage towards that climb. And the breakaway was not likely going to win, but Simmons did hold it out for quite a long time, in my personal opinion. Had roughly two to one minute on that third last climb towards the top then. But on that third last climb, which is with about roughly 35-ish kilometers to go, we saw Quickstep making moves, and we saw that Quickstep was moving forward with Alaphilippe basically leading out Remco on that climb, and they waited until the last portion of the climb to make a move. And that's where Remco decided to make a move, decided to attack, and he had three riders in his wheel, Gana, Pogacar, and also Jai Hindley. And the question there is, they're using Alaphilippe at this point in the race. Now, Alaphilippe before today wasn't looking spectacular, but he wasn't looking shit either, in my personal opinion. So, if we start getting towards that climb, would you have said, if you were the DS, yeah, we're going to use Alaphilippe as a lead out for even a pull on this climb? No, I think... I don't really know what the plan was. Like, uh, I know he did it in Droven course, but he's not going to just ride away on a 200k stage with three of these climbs from Pagacha. It's just not happening. All Ineos. So, unless you're going to have Asgren, Ballerini, an entire train of people, and Honore and Tris Davenines make the whole race hard. It's it's not happening. I, I thought yesterday I thought they'd ride for Alaphilippe in this finish. So I thought they'd ride passively. But I guess Remco needs to gain time somewhere. Um, yeah, I didn't really have a strong view on it. I was just surprised. Yeah, well, I was expecting Remco to attack on that third last climb, though, as it was like the spot that was likely to be the place for him to attack or make a move, knowing they have a Alaphilippe for a defensive finish. But I didn't expect them to use Alaphilippe for that move, quite certainly. Now, the four-man attack didn't last too long, but it was fun, I guess, for the photographers to have a bit of a cool photos of this stage. And then uh, basically roughly, I think, five kilometers later, that four-man group was caught. And Simmons still at the front, roughly starting that second last climb with about a minute, and that would thin down to uh, like 37-ish seconds on the top of that second last Belante climb. No real action there, although Remco and Alaphilippe moved up on the left side of the road. It was Yumbo keeping control right now after those uh, early moves by Pogaccio and Remco to make sure Vingegaard and Kuz could start that final climb in a decent position. And then we came to that final climb, the Belante climb, and Simon was basically caught. So that is out of the picture. It was all coming down to the peloton, and we knew that some people have a... Uh, a chance of winning this stage. We know that Alaphilippe is decent on these kind of finishes, but he's already worked three climbs before, so was he going to be the man for quick step? We didn't know yet. And then we noticed that some attacks happened just before the climb. And that was curious, because it was like a few people trying to get away, including a group at Kuz and so forth. Alaphilippe started bridging towards it, then Jonas tried to jump towards Alaphilippe, and didn't really close it completely, and Remco was closing the last few meters. Like, I'm not sure what was up there, but... I wouldn't be closing on Alaphilippe if I was Remco. Yeah, I think... I don't know. And the UAE domestic, I think Costa, if he's here, was pacing really hard and Pogaccio wasn't in the split. And then Kuz didn't pace. I was confused by that whole thing. I was like, what is? what are you all trying to achieve here? Like, Because no <laughs> one's working. It kind of just keeps surging. No one really knew. Bookman had attacked and initiated, I think. Bookman rises after an okay Andalusia setting uh, Leonard Kemner up. But yeah, it eventually was... 
Demar was in the group. He was looking really good, and he was pacing for Pino, which didn't really work out too well at the end. And it was going to be a sprint finish up this 4K, 5.5% climb. How would Quickstep use Remco and Alaphilippe? Pagancha had no domestiques except, no, he had Soler, but Soler was kind of freelancing. Um, and it turned into chaos. It was a complete uncontrolled shit show for the entire of this climb. <laughs> it's pretty exciting. Who, who attacked? It was at least 10 people. Yeah, that's true. And it was also not really the names that you would expect to make the move initially on this climb. You know that Bardet is the kind of rider to go early on these kind of finishes, and he did. But it was Natnail Tesfacion that made the move for uh, Drone Hopper just after that. And I love that. I love that. Now, I would have hoped that he would wait a bit longer so he can actually get a, a proper result on this finish. But it started looking like these attacks were going nowhere and riders just kept following and so forth. And I think one of the next attacks was Kelderman as well. That didn't go too far. And then the group slowed down a bit, at which point it was an MQ Avenipool that made a move on one side of the road. Bogacha was the one to close that. And attacks kept following, to be honest. Soler went for a little bit, was getting closed as well. After that, it was Miguel Angel Lopez going on the left side of the road, Remco closing that. We had Narvaez going at a certain point. And that's when Alaphilippe started dropping at the back after he basically worked for Remco today. So I don't know. At this point in the race, it was clear that Alaphilippe wasn't going to be an influence on the rest of the stage. That was certain. And then there was the move of the Australian man himself, Richie Port at 1K to go. Didn't know he was here. Didn't, <laughs> honestly didn't know he was here. Um, <laughs> I think he's doing the Giro. He said he doesn't want to do the tour anymore. Um, he didn't seem to want to do the tour last year when he was in it. And he was re- he remembered. He's like, the thing I most remember about Richie Port from last year was giving Pagatra a lead out on stage eight of the tour. So he destroyed Carapaz on Col de Rump. So he's like, let's line that up again. Starts to lead out with Pagatra on his wheel. Gagenhart, I presume it was for Gagenhart, who was quite punchy on stage six of Dauphiné last year, similar finish against Valverde. And but Gagenha was further back. And so Port does the lead out. Eventually, I think Lefay, Lefay, I don't yeah. know how to pronounce it, attacks for Cofidis. He won Giro stage six, maybe in a similar 3K, 6% finish, destroyed everybody. Pagacha bridges to him, gets the gap off Mas on the wheel, and it's done. Pagacha hits his wheel and just continues on with, on with it like a 400 meter sprint, 350 meter sprint uphill. Uh, with and then he made it mano in mano because everyone else is either trying to get the draft off someone failing or not failing coming back in front of them or hitting the win themselves. So he jumped ahead of Jonas. Pagacha won the stage easily after Quickstep couldn't really do anything and Al Philippe was uh, out of the picture. Jonas finished strong, but still two second gap. To him, Lafay on the same time as him and Avon Paul and Chicone on five seconds with Gagan Hart, Mars Kelderman, Landa Hindley, all in the top ten. Aaron Baru, Benji. I thought he did you expect more? Uh, I forgot he was at this race, but <laughs> 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 yeah, I've not been up to date with the Aaron Buru fandom recently, and uh he's eleven on this stage. I don't expect much from him in the coming days either. But uh, I guess it's good that he's getting somewhat of a... Yeah, he's not getting a leadership. Maz is their leader at this race. <laughs> I also forgot that Maz was here. <laughs> yeah. But all in all, yeah, Pogacar getting that quite easily. He's playing this on easy difficulty. And uh, there needs to be an artist Slovenian at the race to put it on extreme difficulty. Because yeah. right now, it's not happening. Jonas is relatively competitive in this race, though, outside of the time trial. So it's good to see that he's getting second on the start of finish. We've seen this stuff from Vingegaard before on the Copie Bartali 2020, as per guess. No, not 2020, 2019. Let's scroll down. No. Oh, my God. When? 2021? No. When did he write? Yeah, 2021. Two stage wins and a second place on similar finishes. So my mind is not defeating me today. Jonas Vingegaard did that quite well, got second here. Somewhat surprised, to be honest, that Evenepoel is still fourth on this finish because... I was too. I That's thought he was going to get like 10 for something after I saw him in the group and so forth. But it's good, I guess. Ciccone, looking decent as well. I think he's going to the Giro. Yes, he is. Yeah, so yeah, he that should be fun. For the rest, I guess... Uh, I'm just happy that Damon Arden's one is still close in GC on fourth place, 36 seconds down after that time trial. Lost some time today, but I guess, I guess he's still doing something decent. But um, Thibaut Pinot getting 18th here. You believe in it? 
Is it happening? Pull him at the door. What's happening? <laughs> Pull him at the door, <laughs> mate. He's. I don't know what the point is. Like, at least he's 18th. Instead of let's have David Godu continue at Parry Nice with some sort of sickness. Every other team's like, oh, you got the flu? You probably should go home. I don't know what's wrong with Godou, but I was like, he's not in the break today. If he's not in the break tomorrow. Like, can someone I, – I think people – it's not just degenerates that listen to this content. I think people in the actual cycling industry listen as well, which always terrifies me. But if anyone who works in World Tour and a team can let me know, um, if you're maybe a physiologist or physio or whatever – is it good training to be basically in the group header every day when you're under the weather or injured instead of recovering in a world tour race? Is that a good idea? Just, I just want to know, is that, is that worthwhile? Um, good question. But yeah. the opposite side view. of the coin, <laughs> the opposite side of the coin is that we thought we could have thought, thought the same about McNulty before today. Nah, because he was just, he was mentally cooked by the crosswinds. I reckon they, he, <laughs> no, seriously, I reckon, you, I saw him on Instagram afterwards, he was like, fuck this. He said, I'd rather be in the real New Orleans, not Orléans. Um, <laughs> on Instagram, <laughs> the crosswind stage, and he crashed. Then the TT, I think, was fine, 13th or whatever. And then once I saw him in the break, I was like, GG, <laughs> he's going to clean this, probably clean it tomorrow. But it's different. Like, go to Benji nearly got OTL'd in the TT. Yeah. Like Groenewegen beat him by 16 seconds and he was not trying. Anyway, that's we've gone back into that. I should read out the GC standings. Pogaccio goes into the blue jersey uh, for the leader of Toreno Adriatico, ahead of Avonapol by nine seconds. Ganner slips into third. Then Aaronsman, as Benji mentioned, in fourth on 26. Gagenhart moves up a lot, 43. Jonas, because of the bad TT, is in sixth on 45. Then Lopez Soler on eighth. Then Port Kelderman. A whole host of other people. Rigoberto Uran is here apparently. Tomorrow's stage is pretty similar finish, to be honest. Uh, I think we're going to see something similar. It's a little bit tighter. It's harder. You reckon it's a harder? A lot harder. Yeah. There's a, I think with about roughly 22 kilometers to go, you've got uh, after the Strada Comunale Calderado, a very steep section, then a section of 900 meters at 11%. Yeah, you're it keeps right. up steep peaks and so forth. You go down towards the Madonna de Te, which is also very steep towards the top as well. I think there were segments up to 20 plus percent in this uh, finish on these hills because I remember it from doing that route review I once did on my own channel. And then towards the end of this, you've got once again the road going up in the end. Again, a peak of 600 meters at 10.7%. And the finish is on cobbles in between a very narrow section, if I recall correctly. So this should be fun, but I'm scared that they will wait long. I hope someone sends it on that Thermo Madonna. That looks steep. I hope someone sends it. I reckon UA will send Soler again. He's looking... I reckon they like they sent Micah and UAE. I think they'll try with him. Otherwise, still the gaps are so small, which really goes against a break, unlike in Paris Nice. Do you reckon? I, I keep going against him. I'm going Pogaccio for the stage win again. Yeah, Pogaccio is again the favorite, like today as well, to be honest. But I do want Remco once again to go early, even if it doesn't make sense in World Tour races all the time. It's what makes stuff interesting and it's what makes stuff entertaining. I don't care if it loses in the chances of winning personally because I want to I want to see a good race. Now, I'm curious if Vingegaard is going to fight for that blue jersey because in the interview today, he was asked if, uh, well, the interviewer said to him, you're, you're getting closer to the blue jersey. And he said, well, what jersey is that again? <laughs> wow. so, so the interview had to explain that it was the leader jersey. And after that, he started talking about the guy in the leader jersey, couldn't name Ghana. Good. <laughs> so I think it's completely done by the end of the stage. Um, so it's your competition, no acknowledgement. Be like, it's just that guy. <laughs> He's just a number. <laughs> Killing yeah, you. Certainly. But I'm afraid that's roughly it for today, right? Well, I actually have a story, Benji, oh, yeah. even though it's a very important story. It's a new segment. It's called Lantern Story Time about his yeah, little okay. life. And so some of you may not know, I actually broke my finger when I was in Valencia back in January, you see. That's why Zwift has been so good. Shout out Zwift. Speaking of Zwift, Tour of Watopia are on at the moment. Did stage one last night. Did the B ride, about 29 Ks. It's pretty fun. 
But yeah, Tour of Utopia, five stages. First one's already done, double XP. I think the power-ups are double the length of time as well, which is kind of cool, people using them in the in the group rides. So yeah, I've been enjoying it. If you want to check it out below, Zwift.com for your free seven-day trial. Um, back in January, went to Valencia, a little training camp, you know, because I am kind of like the pros following them around and no i was actually too scared to run into any of them didn't didn't say i was down there i hate it on social media and was going riding anyway went for a walk and a dog attacked toby and so i had to fight this dog i'm a valiant man of the household and i had to fight it was legit though it actually was a pit bull it's like and um oh attacked was maybe a bit strong but it, it had to be put under control got under control afterwards i realized i've broken my finger um it's, it's you can see on the screen it's still a little bit bent and but I was down there as warm and I was like we've booked the Airbnb for two weeks I'm not going to the doctor to get this checked um, my wife was like you need to go get an x-ray it was black I was like nah I need to get some training in where it's above 10 degrees um, to get back on the program and so I did that didn't get better actually got worse came back to Andorra went to the doctor he's like you're a fucking idiot go to the, go get an x-ray then got an x-ray they're like yeah it's it's fucked mate um, around like the joint at the top just at the top is like a fracture um put it in a splint didn't need surgery splint for three weeks incredibly annoying you probably saw it on the screen i was had that gray thing the dogs also like toby kept chewing on it um came off went back got another x-ray and they're like it's it's semi-fixed you don't need surgery i was like semi-fixed we can live with and then I said to Jack Haig, I was like, man, you got a physio, the one that speaks speaks English, even though my Spanish is all right now. And he's like, yeah, yeah, you got a good guy in, in Escaldes. And so I went along today, 10.30, got walking in the room, whole wall. It's like Yumbo signed Tour de France jerseys, <laughs> FDJ jerseys. He's got memorabilia. He's treated all the guys. He's been in Andorra for 18 years, treated all the guys. And he's like, yeah, I'm actually like, you know, Ineos physio as well contracted to them i was like that's great that you treat all these high profile athletes but you see i have i need you to rehabilitate the tip of my ring finger and this guy looked at me like what the what are you even doing andorra no it wasn't it was nice it's it's serious injury for a youtuber on a keyboard warrior as ryan mullen called me i need to have my fingers right so i'm on a three time a week physio rehabilitation program for the tip of my right ring finger uh with the best physio in andorra so that's yeah. my story time any thoughts on that benji great you just told like thousands of people that they should look at the camera to your finger on the audio podcast <laughs> platform so great job <laughs> great cross promotion this might be a clip i reckon i'll have to put some b-roll for this uh, yeah i don't have the dog attack anyway we're off script uh, any else off script it's scripted and uh we'll see you with the paranese and terreno adriatico recaps tomorrow shout outs with ciao